In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and into the ages of ages. Amen. Glory to thee, O God. Glory to thee, O heavenly King. Comfort the spirit of truth who is everywhere. Present and fill us all things, treasure, blessings, and giver of love. Come in abidance and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls, O good one. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy on us and save us. Amen. Good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in. Uh, Father Matthew, please, uh, uh, you can uh, continue. Okay, Father Brian, thank you so much, as always. <clears throat> and uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to be able to talk so much and, and to have uh, such an extended forum to discuss these very, very important ideas of the writings of the fathers. And uh, in particular, we left off last time discussing the uh, the five points of Calvinism known as TULIP, the TULIP uh, doctrines. And um, in particular, what the connection was that we were looking at was between uh, the writings of St. Augustine uh, <clears throat> and how certain ideas and certain kinds of exaggerations, distortions, misunderstandings within his writings laid the groundwork for um, for theological problems uh, down the road, and in particular for the, uh, the 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 five bedrock doctrines of Calvinism that are collectively known as TULIP. That would be total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. And we saw last time uh, we explored for a long period of time the doctrine known as total depravity, uh, the the idea that after the fall of Adam and Eve there was nothing left inside of man no uh that the image of god essentially had been totally eradicated from him, him and therefore man was incapable in any capacity of either willing or doing what was good um and we saw that this is a heresy that this is actually not what the bible teaches in particular uh we saw passages from the acts of the apostles such as saint peter and paul uh both talking about how among the, the nations of the world, there were people who were striving after God, who were trying to find him. And this basically lays the, the groundwork for um, the entire uh, appreciation of the classical world that the church fathers, especially in Byzantium, always had. Um, and uh, it is why we can study the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans and other cultures, pre-Christian cultures around the world and see such interesting uh, parallels to Christianity in some ways, some you know, dim intimations of Christianity among these uh, pagan cultures, because the image of God wasn't totally eradicated in man, there was still something of the divine spark within our natures, and therefore... Uh, uh, you know, and grace builds upon that, and, and the grace of God calls us kind of through this divine spark that is inside of us. Um, now, what I would like to do then tonight is to deal with essentially um, what, and I'll just make the, the, the point that we also said last time was that this idea of total depravity can seem to find justification in some of the more exaggerated positions uh, found in St. Augustine's writings, particularly his commentaries on the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. And, um, and uh, now, that being said, the most serious of the exaggerations into which St. Augustine fell in his teaching on grace and on free will is to be found in his idea of predestination. This is the idea for which he is most often attacked uh, in, in, among Orthodox writers in our modern day times. And it is certainly the one idea in his works which, when grossly misunderstood, has historically produced the most frightful consequences uh, in the unbalanced minds um, of the Protestant Reformation, who were totally unrestrained by the orthodoxy of St. Augustine's thought in general. It should be kept in mind, however, that for most people today, the term predestination is usually misunderstood in its later Calvinistic meaning, which we're going to talk all about tonight. Um, but that is not the correct meaning. It is, it, it, there is a doctrine of predestination that is biblical, and we are going to explore that tonight um, right away. But there is also, but that is not usually the way most people understand that term. When people hear the term predestination, they immediately think of Calvinism. 
And um, those who have not studied the question are sometimes inclined to accuse St. Augustine himself of the same monstrous heresy that is to be found in Calvinism. But it must be stated at the outset of this uh, of our discussion tonight that St. Augustine most certainly did not teach predestination as most people would understand it today, that is in the Calvinistic sense. What he did do, as with the rest of his doctrine on grace, was to teach the orthodox doctrine of predestination, but in an exaggerated and therefore defective way, which was easily liable to misinterpretation. Okay, so let's first of all begin with what is the biblical doctrine uh, and therefore the orthodox doctrine of predestination. Um, well, first of all, we have to make uh, some distinctions immediately. We have to understand that there is a difference that must be uh, understood between divine predestination and divine foreknowledge. Okay, that's the first de distinguishing thing that we should make, because nobody would really disagree that God, who is omn omniscient, knows the future before it happens, and he knew before the world began that uh, who would be saved and who would not be saved. Nobody really would, would uh, I think, even um, um, among Protestants or uh, any Calvinists or anything like that, um, there, nobody would have any problem with that idea. And there's many places in the Bible that we can see that, such as Galatians 1.15, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, or Psalm 139, 138 in the Orthodox numbering, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So God sees our whole life and saw our whole life from time immemorial, uh, even before time began, and he knows all things. But that's not what predestination is. Okay, Obviously, for divine foreknowledge is going to be connected to the doctrine of divine predestination. Um, but it is, it is distinguished from it. It's not a, it is not the same thing. So let's see what are the biblical passages that teach divine predestination. Well, first of all, we have uh, the term, the pre, actually, interestingly enough, the term predestination is not even found as a noun inside of the New Testament. Okay, so let's just put that out there right now. Um, there is a verb, though, uh, that is um, uh, that is found, pro orizo, which means to set apart or somehow define beforehand. Okay, um, that's basically, so that's, that is what the, the term in Latin, predestinare, uh, come, translates to. Um and then there are other words. There is the, the concept of election, eklogi. Uh, there is um, uh, there there are words like um, the, the divine plan or design, the prothesis. Uh, these are various terms that are found inside of the New Testament. But the places where, as a verb, we do see the concept of predestination. The first one is in Romans eight twenty nine through thirty, uh, when Saint Paul says, "Quote for whom he God did foreknow." He also did, did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Okay, so there is the first kind of scriptural locus for this. How are we to understand this? Well, obviously, we should turn to the fathers. And... Um, but and we will get there in a moment. Let's take, let's hold that thought for one second, and now I'm going to show you the other passage, really one of three uh, the, inside of the New Testament that talks about predestination. The third is a reference to Christ, actually, that he was predestined to offer himself up uh, on the cross, and uh, th that God knew that before all time. Uh, we will leave that one to the side because it deals with the Lord and not with us. Um, but the other passage, uh, the, talking about human beings be being predestinated is Ephesians 1, 3 through 12, and we'll just read this together now. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, uh, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, 
wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Okay, so these are obviously extremely important passages in St. Paul's writings for our understanding of, of soteriolo soteriology, okay, how it is that we are saved, how it is that we are justified before God, and how it is that we, um, uh, we partake of the salvation that Christ has wrought for all men. Okay, so the first one, uh, let's go back now, if we, if we will, do, just to the Romans 8, um, uh, where St. Paul says the following, this is Romans 8, 29 through 30, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. So what is uh, St. John Chrysostom say about this. Now, before we even turn to what St. John Chrysostom says, because uh, I take him to be, uh, I, and I use him as an authority, because he is one of the greatest Orthodox commentators on Scripture of all time, and uh, and also, he was actually uh, very influential over St. John Cassian, whom we learned about in the last several lectures, was kind of the uh, the spokesman for the orthodox doctrine of synergy over against the Augustinian idea of kind of absolute uh, prevenient grace, uh, whereas the orthodox doctrine of synergy does leave more room for the freedom of the will, and there's a necessity of free will to work uh, in, in, to, in works of, of righteousness uh, so as to acquire the grace of God. Um, now, so this is the imagined heresy in Catholic sources known as semi-Pelagianism, but it is not a heresy. It is the orthodox position. And St. John Chrysostom was, as I said, very influential over St. John Cassian. And, um, and therefore, he, he, we know we are getting kind of the, the, kind of the pristine orthodox interpretation of this doctrine. So in this passage, in, in his 15th homily on Romans, St. John Chrysostom says the following. The apostle here speaks of foreknowledge, prothesis, or which is purpose or design, in order that not everything should be ascribed to the calling. Right? Because if we just go back to the passage now, for those God, whom God foreknew, he also predestined. Okay, so there's foreknowledge and there's predestination, pre knowing before and destinating before. He predestined them to be conformed to the likeness of his, of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. So now, the apostle speaks of foreknowledge in order that not everything should be ascribed to the calling. Okay, calling means those who hear the word of the Lord and become Christians. Okay, that's what, um, or I should say, they, they, maybe they don't, uh, they don't uh, heed that calling. The calling is the invitation uh, by Christ to become a Christian. Okay, that's the seed being cast upon the ground. But the seed is not always, it doesn't always grow up. Okay, so that's heeding the poem. So there is the call, and there is the heeding of the call. And if we return to what the words of St. John, for if the calling alone were sufficient, then why have not all been saved? Therefore, he says that the salvation of the called is accomplished not by the calling alone, but also by foreknowledge. And the calling itself is not compulsory or forcible. We're going to see that this is also going to be a misunderstanding, an error, a heresy of Calvinism, the idea of irresistible grace, okay? That is not the correct way. God, unfortunately, uh, we, we, can, we can unfortunately resist God, is what, I, what I'm trying to say. We, God respects our freedom to such a degree that if, even though he will give us every opportunity and every grace and every sufficiency so that we can respond to the call, nevertheless, we still are, still are ultimately capable of saying no. Thus, all have been called, but not all have obeyed. Okay, so that's what St. John Chrysostom has to say about this passage in Romans. Let's take a look at the other passage from Ephesians, okay? I'll just read the highlighted parts for you. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, 
having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. St. John Chrysostom commenting on the third verse here, um, uh, that is, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the fourth verse, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. In love, saith he, having predestinated us. So St. John Chrysostom really focuses on this idea that he predestines us out of love. This comes not of any pains, nor of any good works of ours, but out of love. And yet, not of love alone, but also of our virtue. For if indeed, if, if it were love alone, it would follow that all must be saved. Whereas again, were it the result of our virtue alone, then were his coming needless. Right? That would be Pelagianism. If we could be saved simply by virtue of our own good works, then Christ did need to come. And, and sacrifice himself on the cross. And, uh, and there would be the whole dispensation, the whole, the whole Christian economy would be unnecessary. But it is the result neither of his love alone, nor yet of our virtue alone, but of both. Okay, so again, the doctrine of, of synergy. That's how St. John Chrysostom takes this. So if that's not 100% clear as to what we believe about it, let's take a look at a very nice distillation uh, by a more recent saint of the Orthodox Church, St. Theophon the Recluse, a Russian saint of the 19th century. And he explains the Orthodox position very clearly. Concerning free creatures, God's predestination does not obstruct their freedom and does not make them involuntary executors of his decrees. Okay, so predestination does not mean our freedom is somehow overridden. Free actions God foresees as free. He sees the whole course of a free person and the general sum of all his actions. And seeing this, he decrees as if it had already been accomplished. It is not that the actions of free persons are the consequence of predestination, but that predestination itself is the consequence of free deeds. Okay, so... It's a hard concept to grasp. In fact, I would even go so far as to say that um, predestination is kind of one of the most difficult theological concepts to kind of wrap your mind around. Um, uh, but uh, as with everything with Christianity, Christianity challenges us. Its doctrines challenge us mentally. And I would even say that that is further evidence of the truth of them, right? Uh, there is nothing challenging about the Islamic notion of uh, of Allah being a, a perfect unity, uh, that is a perfect monad, um, right? Uh, absolute uh, monotheism uh, doesn't challenge the mind at all. The Trinity does challenge the mind, okay? That is a difficult uh, doctrine to get your mind around, okay? Uh, the dual nature of Christ, that he is one person and two with two natures, that challenges the mind, okay? That is not something that, um, if you just wanted to make up a religion, and you, know, you would make it kind of as simple and as straightforward as, as for people to get, uh, like Islam, okay? But, uh, but that is not how Christianity works, okay? It challenges us at every turn with its doctrines, and yet, in my opinion, that is, that is further proof of their truth, actually. Um, and certainly, predestination is right up there with one of, the, one of the most difficult to grasp mentally. Now, so the concept, though, is that God sees how we will act, even before we have acted in that way. And his ultimate d uh, decree about how we will, whether or not we will be saved, in a sense, has already been made because you already knew the sum total of our life, right? Because the Bible teaches that each man will be, record will be awarded according to his deeds, uh, as it says in the book of Revelation. And so God only already knows all of our deeds. And therefore, he is already from before time began made a decree about our salvation. And yet it was because of how our freedom would ultimately behave uh, and what choices we would make with our freedom. Okay, that's the idea. That's the orthodox interpretation of it. Now, <clears throat> getting back to St. Augustine, Augustine's overlogicalness required him to try to look, I would say, too closely at this mystery and try to explain its seeming difficulties in, in terms that we're kind of using just ordinary logic. 
um, right? If one is in the number of the predestined, does one still need to struggle uh, for one's salvation, right? That would be kind of pushing it. So like, you know, if, if everything is sort of already known and the decision about my salvation has in a sense already been made, then can I just take to the couch and kind of like, you know, if either way, right? If I'm already destined to be saved, then what? Then I don't really need to do anything. And if I'm destined not to be saved, then it doesn't matter if I do anything. That's the sort of, if you start thinking about it in too strict of a logical kind of way, it's not really logical, but it, you know what I mean? If you start thinking about it in terms of too much in our, you know, trying to get our minds around it, then you could wind up with that sort of conundrum. And we don't, we and we shouldn't follow him in his reasonings in this regard, except to note that he himself felt the difficulty of his own position. And he found it often necessary to justify himself and to qualify his teaching so that it would not be misunderstood. So, for instance, um, in his treatise on the gift of perseverance, he notes, um, I'm sorry, I don't have this uh, quote for you. Um, he says, this doctrine must not be preached to congregations in such a way as to seem to an unskilled multitude or a people of slower understanding to be in some measure confuted by that very preaching of it. Okay, so uh, you see, he feels the tension of it. So, you know, he's kind of thinking like, okay, if people start, you know, if, if I'm explaining that, well, it, it, people might get the wrong idea, it doesn't really matter what you do then anymore, because everything is already kind of faded. Um, he, he understood that. Uh, and, and it's a remarkable uh, admission of the complexity of this doctrine. Um, but the complexity of this doctrine, which is incidentally often felt by Western converts to the Orthodox faith, uh, much more so than people who have kind of been just sort of at home in orthodoxy for their entire lives, uh, or, or indeed us converts until we have acquired some experience in actually living according to orthodoxy. This sort of complexity resides only in those who have tried to resolve it intellectually. The Orthodox teaching on the cooperation of God and man, of free will and grace that we've been spending so much time on, and of the necessity, the necessity of ascetic struggle in the course of our salvation, which is what St. Paul means when he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. All of this, and of course, and, 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 and with the knowledge of, of the certain will that God wills that everyone be saved, as we read in 1 Timothy 2.4, all of this is sufficient, really, to dissolve the unnecessary complications which human logic introduces into this question. But Augustine's intellectualized view of predestination, as he himself, as I mentioned, already realized, tended to produce erroneous opinions concerning grace and free will in the minds of some of his hearers. Um, these opinions had apparently become common even within a few years of Augustine's death, and one of the great fathers of Gaul at this time found it necessary to combat them. That was St. Vincent of Larnes. Uh, he was a theologian of the great island monastery uh, off the coast, Larnes off the southern coast of Gaul, that was, as we've talked about many times in our earlier talks, so faithful to the Eastern doctrine of symmetry, I'm sorry, synergy. Um, that, remember St. John Cassian is there, and he, um, uh, you know, his teachings on grace, um, and, uh, uh, you know, especially in his, in his conferences, um, uh, he, in especially Conference 13, if you want to look at that, that's in the Erdman series. Um, you know, th this, is, th this place was, they particularly uh, were faithful to this orthodox understanding of grace and free will. Well, St. Vincent of Larens in his commonatory in the year 330, 340, sorry, 334, um, in order to combat the, what he calls, quote, profane novelties of various heresies which had been attacking the church. He, he censures the view of one group who, quote, dare to promise in their teaching that in their church, that is, in their own small circle, is to be found a great and special and entirely personal form of divine grace. That is, it is divinely administered without any pain, without any zeal, or effort on their part at all to all persons belonging to their group, even if they do not ask or seek or knock. Thus, they are borne up by the angels. Okay, so this, you can see how the, when, when St. Augustine's teachings were kind of taken by later writers, and even very soon after his death, they are already were being misunderstood because of this idea that, well, if grace is totally 100% necessary for all of our 
every good deed of ours, then what is, then how on earth can you, why should we try to exert ourselves in asceticism at all? Okay. And that is, of course, as I mentioned before, why Protestantism has no monks, why there's no monasticism in Protestantism, because you know your salvation come your grace comes totally just from uh just from faith and um and so there's no need to exert oneself to put in any labor any hard work any prostrations any fastings any anything like that um and uh and so anyway so th this is this idea was already being found among certain christians in gaul by uh this year 434 there is another work also of this time which contains similar criticisms um, it is known as the Objections of Vincent, which may possibly be a work by the same St. Vincent of Lerins. It is a collection of, quote, logical deductions from statements of Blessed Augustine, uh, which, to be sure, every right-believing Orthodox Christian would have to oppose. Uh, so, for instance, uh, it's, it states that, quote, God is the author of our sins. God forbid, but that is what that says. Another one, repentance is useless for one predestined to death. Another, God has created the greater part of the human race for eternal damnation. Now, those are all monstrous heresies, and yet they are all going to be found in Calvinism a thousand years later, okay? Uh, because they are the logical deductions of w when, you start, when you start pushing the exaggerated and distorted points of view that one finds in, uh, in St. Augustine to their logical conclusions. Well, if the criticisms of these two books were directed against St. Augustine himself, uh, they are really unfair because Augustine never taught such a doctrine of predestination. He never taught, and we'll get to this in a moment, that God is responsible for our sins, that he, he predestines us to damnation or anything like that uh, by, by his own sovereignty and not, by, not having anything to do with our own will. Um, and, and all of this, uh, you know, this idea that... Um, that grace comes 100% uh, from, from God, uh, well, that the, the grace of God is given 100% at his own discretion and not according to our own labors at all. This essentially destroys the whole meaning of ascetic struggle. And he himself was a monk, and so he would have definitely not agreed with that. He found it necessary, actually, in one of his letters, to come out against those who, as he put it, quote, were extolling grace to such an extent that they deny the, the freedom of the human will. That is in letter 214 of St. Augustine. And he certainly would have been on St. Vincent's side against those whom, uh, whom he criticized. That is, St. Vincent criticized. St. Vincent's criticisms are indeed valid. However, when they are directed, and correctly so, against the immoderate followers of St. Augustine, that is, those who distorted the teaching uh, uh, of St. Augustine in an unorthodox direction and neglecting all of St. Augustine's explanations taught that God's grace is effective without human effort, um, they are opposed ultimately to what St. Augustine himself would have actually believed. But as I keep mentioning, you do, if you take certain passages of his writings out of context, you can come to those conclusions. And unfortunately, even with all of those kind of like, you know, trying to get St. Augustine off the hook for all, uh, with all of these kind of things I've just said, there really is this one point of Augustine's teachings on grace um, that uh, he, where he does really fall into a serious error. And that is in particular on his teaching about um, uh, predestination. This is where he falls into a serious error, and, which has, you know, given fuel to heretics throughout the ages and, and because they have made, taken from his writings the authority for uh, for their doctrines. So in Augustine's view of grace and freedom, St. Paul's statement that God wills all men to be saved, which I just quote a few in 1 Timothy 2.4. In St. Augustine's opinion, this cannot be literally taken. This cannot be literally true, that God wills all men to be saved. Okay, That is a position that St. Augustine does take. Um, because, he says, if God predestines only some to be saved, then he must will only those to be saved. And here again, we have this kind of overly logicalness where he fails to understand the mystery of Christian truth, that our freedom of will is intimately connected to this whole process. But St. Augustine, because he is so logical, he tries to explain the passage of Scripture in a way that is consistent with his whole teaching on grace. And therefore, he says the following. He, God, wills all men to be saved, is so said 
that all the predestined may be understood by it, because every kind of man is among them. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing, but it's just so ridiculous, right? I mean, that, um, that idea that when St. Paul clearly says in 1 Timothy 2.4, God desireth that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And St. Augustine says, well, he doesn't, by all men, he really means only the predestined to be saved, because that class includes all kind of men. You see, all races or backgrounds or whatever character types um well uh this is in his work on rebuke and grace and therefore he doesn't he he actually does deny we can't we can't get around it he does deny that god wills all men to be saved and that is totally wrong okay that is completely wrong worse still saint augustine is carried so far by the logical consistency of his thought that he even teaches although only in a new in a few places he teaches a negative predestination. That is what would later come to be termed in Calvinism a, a double predestination, a predestination to eternal damnation, um, which is entirely foreign to the scriptures. Okay, uh, he, For instance, he speaks clearly of a class of men which is predestined to destruction. That is a direct quote from his uh, anti-Pelagian work on man's perfection and righteousness, chapter 13. And in another place, he says, to those whom he has predestined to eternal death, he is also the most righteous awarder of punishment. Now, I don't. I should. I said just a moment ago that this is what would later become called double predestination in Calvinism. That's not really correct. Double predestination is actually different in some ways. That's actually the the idea that God wills for those people to commit sin so that they will be damned. Um, but that is not the, the idea that is found in St. Augustine. So it's it's not quite as horrendous as that. Um, but here again, we must be careful not to read into Augustine's word. In fact, those later interpretations of them which Calvin made. Um, because Augustine in this doctrine does not at all maintain that God determines or wills any man to do evil. That's really the big distinction. There. The whole context of his thought here makes it clear that he believed no such thing. God certainly would never will anyone to commit sin. And he often, uh, that is St. Augustine, denied this specific accusation, sometimes with evident exasperation. Uh, for instance, when it was objected to him that, quote, it is by his own fault that anyone deserts the faith when he yields and consents um, to the temptation, which is the cause of his desertion of the faith. Um, this is, uh, that is the idea that, that God this was against the idea that God determines a man to desert the faith. Augustine found it necessary to, uh, to, to make no reply except who denies it. In other words, uh, obviously it is man's own work that he deserts the faith and not because God has willed him to, uh, to desert the faith. This is we're going to get to. This is the P of Tulip, the perseverance of the saints. Um, and some decades later, the disciple of St. Augustine, Fulgentius of Ruspa, which is in North Africa, in interpreting this difficult teaching this, uh, of St. Augustine, he says the following, In no other sense do I suppose that that passage of St. Augustine should be taken, in which he affirms that there are certain persons predestinated to destruction than in regard to their punishment, not their sin, not to the evil which they unrighteously commit, but to the punishment which they shall righteously suffer. He says this in his work, Ad Monium. So in other words, even one of his disciples says, it's not, no, it's not that God wills any man to sin. It's that he wills his, uh, he, he, he will uh, will his righteous um, punishment for those sins. Augustine's doctrine, therefore, on predestination to eternal death does not state that God wills or determines any man to desert the faith or to do evil, nor to be condemned to hell by God's arbitrary will, quite apart from man's free choice of good or evil, which is what Calvin will teach. Rather, it states that God wills the condemnation of those who of their own free will do evil. Um, and even this, though, is not the orthodox teaching. Okay, that's an cru crucial point to understand. Even here, St. Augustine and indeed St. Uh, uh, Fulgentius are both incorrect because uh, God does not even will it then. Okay, God does not even will our, our condemnation even then when we deserve it. 
Okay. Um, and, and, and because of this kind of the way that this is being explained here among the, you can see St. Augustine himself, and then those who are close to him and his, his other holy bishops who were, you know, obviously wanting to, to be correct about everything, but they, they wound up being influenced by this error. They, this winds up being liable to lead people astray in time. And later people, later theologians and Protestant reformers looking back at these early church writings who were so influenced by Augustine, they will come, they will find uh, fodder for their position on this. Um, now, St. Augustine's teaching about this very issue that, uh, you know, that God predestines some to damnation, that is, you know, willing their punishment um, uh, be, for, for, for their sins. Uh, this opinion was expressed uh, uh, even before St. John Cassian wrote his conferences, which, uh, uh, which give the orthodox position in this, but yet it is obvious uh, that um, St. John Cassian uh, uh, certainly had St. Augustine's position in mind, because as I mentioned before, in his 13th conference, St. John Cassian gives a clear orthodox answer to this error, uh, where he says the following. For if he, God, willeth not that one of his little ones should perish, I'll start again. For if God willeth not that one of his little ones should perish, how can we imagine without grievous blasphemy that he does not generally will all men, but only some instead of all, to be saved? Those then who perish, perish against his will. And that, my dear friends, is the orthodox position on this. Okay. Um, that those who go to hell are not doing it because God is uh, somehow willing that, but it's because God respects our freedom and those people are perishing contrary to the will of God. Augustine would not be able to accept such a doctrine because he falsely, as we've seen many times, absolutized grace uh, to such a degree that he does not leave room for the, f the free operation of man to work against what is God's will uh, in, in an ultimate sense. And therefore, can he, Augustine can conceive of nothing that can happen against the will of God ultimately. But in the orthodox doctrine of synergy, it makes perfect sense. Uh, and it gives true place for the mystery of human freedom and the absolute sovereignty of God. Uh, and, and human freedom, uh, terrifyingly, can choose not to accept what God has willed for it uh, and constantly calls us to. Uh, now, the doctrine of predestination, and not even in Augustine's restricted sense, but in the fatalistic sense that it was given by later heretics, had, as I've mentioned many times already, a lamentable future in the West. Uh, I'm going to walk you through that history of it uh right now very briefly we we don't have to go into it in uh in in excruciating detail but i'll give you you know maybe 15 20 minutes of, of worth of of the history of this doctrine up until and including calvinism and then i'll just end with the um with the orthodox uh um conciliar decisions of, of uh, anathematizing this uh this heresy even within fifth century western europe there were already uh, starts. There, there, there began to be. There, there began at least the first of three outbreaks of this idea of the fatalistic sense of uh, predestination. The first was by a priest named Lucidus, who taught an absolute predestination both to salvation and damnation. Uh, he taught of God's power irresistibly impelling some to perform good works and others to perform evil. Now, he later repented of this doctrine after being combated by the intrepid St. Faustus of Rees. Um, this is the ancient regium. He was a bishop there. Um, a, a worthy uh, uh, bishop of St. Vincent of Lerins and St. John Cassian. As you can see, St. Faustus is also a saint. Um, and, uh, and then this position was totally condemned by the Council of Arles in the year 475. Uh, not too long after that, in the ninth century, there was a Saxon monk named Botschalk of Arbeis, uh, which, as you can tell, is in Germany. 
And um, he started the controversy anew, affirming two absolutely similar predestinations, one, salva one to salvation and one to damnation. Uh, he denied human freedom as well as um, he, deni the den he denied God's will to save all men. And thus there was aroused a violent controversy in the, uh, in the Frankish Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, as it was, uh, it was being called at that time. You can see by those dates where, just, where the next generation really after Charlemagne. Um, and then I mentioned there were kind of three big eruptions of, of this heresy in the West. The, one, the third one was, of course, in, during the Protestant Reformation, where you have figures like Luther, and Zwingli, and especially Calvin, who taught the most extreme and heinous form of predestination, that God has created some men as, quote, vessels of wrath for sin and eternal damnation, and, uh, and others, of course, uh, vessels of mercy. And they, they taught that salvation and damnation are granted by God solely at his pleasure, without regard to men's actions at all. Okay, that is really, see, we're going to talk more about this in a moment, but hold on to that idea. That really is the, it's sort of like the most rigorous position of Augustinianism that one could imagine in this regard. It's, it's um, uh, Augustine himself never taught anything like these gloomy and most unchristian doctrines. And yet, uh, just to show you how it must be admitted that he, he was in some sense kind of the you know, the intellectual sort of patron of their, of these ideas, uh, you know, no doubt, uh, unwillingly, accidentally. Um, even the Catholic encyclopedia, uh, uh, I'll quote you from an older edition, from the 1911 editions, even this one, uh, you know, who, of course, St. Augustine is such a big figure in the Catholic Church, even they admit that, um, uh, that he that that saint augustine is kind of indefensible in this way uh we quote the origin of heretical predestination predestinarianism this is just another way of saying the same thing must be traced back to the misunderstanding and misrepresentation of saint augustine's views relating to eternal election and reprobation but it was only after his death that this heresy sprang up in the church in the west whilst that of the East was preserved in a remarkable manner from these extravagances. I love that last part. Uh, that's why I'm quoting it to you, even though it's such an old encyclopedia entry. The Church of the East was preserved in a remarkable manner from these extravagances. I wonder why. Nothing can be clearer than that the East was preserved from these heresies precisely because of the correct doctrine about the interplay between grace and free will that St. John Cassian taught, that he learned himself from the Eastern monks and from people like St. John Chrysostom, and that he brought back to the West, to his monasteries in Gaul, who, and he correctly taught uh, these other saints, St. Vincent of Lerins, St. Faustus of Rees and others, about this, about the proper relationship between grace and freedom, uh, which left no room for misinterpretations of this doctrine. Okay, so that is why, of course, ultimately the main cause is God has preserved the Orthodox Church. Uh, as he said, the gates of hell will never, never prevail against it. But uh, it was because of this, it was because of, of this particular doctrine of, of uh, about grace and free will that uh, that the Orthodox never had to never had these kind of problems in terms of dealing with predestination. Okay, now. Let me talk more about it, uh, kind of in, in kind of just uh, about Calvinism in this particular regard, and that that, that is where we will end. Um, now, Tulip, as as you see in front of you, typically begins with uh, total depravity, but in many ways, it really should be, uh, and 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 the un unconditional election that is God elects for some people to be to be saved and others to be reprobate, that is to be lost. Um, the the emphasis uh, really should it really should start the other way around. The unconditional election is kind of the fountainhead of uh, of, of of all of the rest of these heresies. Um, and because why is that? Because the emphasis is very clearly on the transcendent sovereignty of God. Okay, Calvin was very very big on this idea that God can do what he wants because he is God, and of course that is true. But. You see, like all heresies, it has truth to it. There's no doubt about it. Um, 
but he pushes it to such a degree that as Calvin pushes it to such a degree that he would say that because God is so transcendently sovereign, that his work of redemption is totally independent of the human will. Okay, and so, for instance, we see in the Canons of Dort, which is one of these Protestant confessions, uh, quote, some receive the gift of faith from God and others do not receive it. And this proceeds from God's eternal decree. Okay, so God willed and decreed before time immemorial that these people would not get the gift of faith and others would. Okay, that is wrong. Calvin himself says uh, he uses a medical analogy to describe his doctrine of double predestination. We assert that with respect to the elect, this plan was freely founded upon his freely given mercy without regard to human worth, but by his just and irre irreprehensible but incomprehensible judgment, he has barred the door of life to those whom he has given over to damnation. Uh, now, uh, we can just kind of stop there. Now, as I mentioned before, although the, the doctrine of total depravity comes first, it is not the logical starting point of Tulip. Okay, the real starting point is this second article of an unconditional election. God's transcendent sovereignty is the true starting point for Calvin's theology. And, and this was actually uh, talked about very um, uh, very uh, clearly by Karl Barth, who was a 20th century Protestant theologian. And he argued that in Calvin's insistence on God's absolute sovereignty, which characterizes Calvin's theology, double predestination is just simply a logical outworking of the fundamental premise of transcendental sovereignty. The Calvinist doctrine of unconditional election, however, as we've seen, and I'm gonna show you even more proof of, is at total odds with genuine Christianity, with biblical, apostolic, patristic orthodoxy, um, uh, who, uh, and, and because the fathers all taught that predestination always has to be based on God's foreknowledge of how we will use our free will. Okay, those are the two pieces that you have to kind of put together. Okay, three pieces. God predestines because of what he foreknows about how we will use our totally free will. St. John, um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get to, I didn't get to read the, um, the, the slide before about um, uh, the, uh, the medical analogy. Um, this is what Calvin says. Therefore, though all of us are by nature suffering from the same disease, only those whom it pleases the Lord to touch with his healing hand will get well. The others whom he in his righteous judgment passes over waste away in their own rottenness until they are consumed. There is no other reason why some persevere to the end while others fall at the beginning of the course. Okay, and as I keep saying, that is totally at odds with patristic orthodoxy. For instance, again, remember those three pieces. God predestines because he foreknows how we will use our free will. Here we have St. John of Damascus writing, uh, the earliest systematic theology of the Orthodox faith. He says, quote, we ought to understand that while God knows all things beforehand, yet he does not predetermine all things. For he knows beforehand those things that are in our power, but he does not predetermine them. For it is not his will that there should be wickedness, nor does he choose to impel, compel virtue. So that predetermination is the work of the divine command based on foreknowledge, but on the other hand, God predetermines those things which are not within our power in accordance with his prescience. You see, so there are some things that are clearly foreordained and predetermined that are outside of the will of, of, of a human being. Okay, so if there's a hurricane or something like that or any, anything other natural phenomenon you could think of, those things, yes, are predetermined without, uh, without request to anyone else, respecting anyone else's free will because they don't involve human free will. Another patristic source, uh, St. Gregory Palamas, asserts the same principle. He says the following, Therefore God does not decide what men's will, will shall be. It is not that he foreordains and thus foreknows, but that he foreknows and thus foreordains, and not by his will, but by his knowledge of what we shall freely will or choose. Regarding the free choices of men, when we say God foreordains, it is only to signify that his foreknowledge is infallible, right? So God knows perfectly well what our choices in this life will be that will affect our salvation. And he has determined our salvation uh, based beforehand, before we even do those things, 
only because he knows perfectly well how what exactly we will do. To our finite minds, it is incomprehensible how God has foreknowledge of our choices and actions without willing or causing them. We make our choices in freedom, which God does not violate. They are in his foreknowledge, but his foreknowledge differs from the divine will and indeed from the divine essence. Okay. Um, now, this is really this is really quite um, uh, such a perfect distillation, really. St. Gregory Palamas, all of these wonderful late Byzantine theologians, they just so perfectly synthesize the entire tradition of Orthodox theology. Um, and uh, there's such wonderful figures to study and to learn from. Uh, even with what limited resources we have available in English. But um, uh, so this is really how we have to understand this, that there is a difference between God's foreknowledge and his willing. Okay, And of course, that just makes so much sense. Right? He know, foreknows all things, yet he does not will those things. Okay, and But this is the deep and blasphemous heresy, heresy of, of Calvin. Uh, you know, that I, I one time heard it put, by a Calvinist preacher, he actually said this, God doesn't hate you because you sin. Uh, you sin because God hates you. Okay, he actually said that. And for those of you that uh, that have uh, might be familiar with some of the early American preachers like Jonathan Edwards, there is a very famous, infamous, I would say, uh, um, sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which, you know, it, people apparently fainted on the spot when they were listening to it because John uh, Jonathan Edwards was such a perf uh, such a talented preacher and he used such vivid imagery, you know. But he but it's so horrible, it's so monstrous, you know. And one cannot help but think that it, it is because of this sort of monstrosity of theology um, that that there is that militant atheism arose. Right, militant atheism has never arisen in any organically speaking in any other culture around the world, except in Christian cultures, okay? Now, why would that be? Why is it that we do not see militant atheism in the Islamic world, organically growing up, you know? When I say militant atheism, I mean like what you see in the French Revolution, in the Russian Revolution, you know, lining up people against the wall and shooting them, you know, because they believe in Christ. Um, you know, and, and the only other places in the world where it has come into being are in places that have Im imported militant atheism, to their countries by Western ideologies like Marxism in China or North Korea or something like that. But it never ap appears organically in those cultures. And one can't help but think maybe it's because of this monstrosity, uh, this celestial dictatorship, as Christopher Hitchens put it, a famous atheist, uh, you know, which, which the Calvinistic world um, created, you know, uh, you know, in their fever dreams. Well, I'll just end you, uh, land you with one last quotation that totally um, is uh, at, at, uh, of a piece with the patristic consensus that I've been outlining for you with all of these quotations. Um, and this is in the Confession of Decithius. You recall last, uh, last week that we talked about this. The Protestant Reformation was sort of not really talked about in any conciliar way by the Orthodox Church uh, when it happened. So uh, whereas in the Catholic Church, they had to deal with it. It was in their backyard. It was really against them more than anything else. So um, they had to um, they had to have their Council of Trent. But uh, in the Orthodox Church, you don't see a Council of Trent in the 1500s. You don't see any, any kind of conciliar response to Protestantism until 1672, which is a long time later, you know, well over 100 years later after Calvin. Um, and certainly even longer, 150 years after Luther. Um, because, uh, and the only reason for that was because the, as we talked about before, the Jesuits basically had forged this work known as the Confessions, uh, the Confession of, of uh, Cyril Lucaris, who was the patriarch of Constantinople in the 1620s. And it purported to be uh, a confession of Protestant <laughs> Protestantism, which, you know, saying that this was the faith of the East, which is ludicrous. Uh, but because of this forgery, um, and, it, and, it, and it, it purported to believe in all of these doctrines uh, of Protestantism, the, the Orthodox Church had to deal with it. So they called the council, and in 1672, they anathematized point by point all of these various doctrines. So I'll just read you the one now. That uh, This is from Decree Number 3 from the Synod in Jerusalem in 1672, the Council, the, the Confession of Decithius. Decithius is the patriarch of, of Jerusalem, who you see pictured on the right here. 
and uh, and it says the following. But to say as the most wicked heretics and as is contained in the chapter answering hereto, that God is predestinating or condemning, uh, that, that God in predestinating or condemning had in no wise regard to the works of those predestinated or condemned, we know to be profane and impious. Okay, so in other words, it, it, it's, it's very, very straightforward. Or, the Orthodox faith clearly rejects this. The, the Bible rejects it. All of the early saints reject it. Uh, all of the later saints reject it too. So uh, there's, really, uh, there's really no question about it at all. So I think with that, my friends, it's probably a good place to maybe um, put a bookmark in it, and I'll take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> Thank you, Father. I think it was uh, very important that we kind of finish it, uh, finish with the with what is the position of the of the Orthodox Church at the end, because the, even though it was occupied by the Ottomans and was not so much involved into the church life in the West because of the the known historical, political, and uh, other reasons, still the church was uh, open to to listen and and eventually to made its own discernment based on this thing. So these documents are very important from the council in Jerusalem, and there are also others. However, this whole thing about the Calvinism remind me when you said the militant atheism, it's yes. so, so profound, so powerful today, especially in the West, yeah. and is the, the seed for the, the, the birth or, or the resurrection of the, the, again, the socialism, Marxism, this uh, counterculture of uh, different ideologies that are very demonic. Absolutely. In essence, it's all just about rebellion against God. We can see even that in the bodies of the people, you know, how we dress, how we tattoo ourselves, how we behave, how we um, attack the, the nucleus of the family, um, the patriarchy, so-called, and, and so forth, but family in general, the abortion and all of those things, it all, they're all rooted in this uh, militant atheism. Absolutely. Uh, actually, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, some of the, the intellectuals at the time, just right before the beginning of rom romantism, romantism, which just started as a movement in, East, in Europe in general, in the 18th century, was actually as a reaction against Calvinism. They thought that Calvin's God is actually the devil himself. And uh, it's why it was kind of uh, interesting to hear that. Yeah, go yes. ahead, Mike, <clears throat> just unmute yourself and... and uh, I post a question. Uh, yeah, hi, Deacon Matthew. Um, Hello, I just had a quick question. Hey there. I had a question uh, about um, Molinism or the uh, doctrine that was uh, posited by Philip Molina, the Jesuit counter reformer, okay. uh, where he uh, posited uh, a view called middle knowledge, where God kind of understands. Um, what kind of circumstances or what kind of choices you will make in certain circumstances. And then he kind of sovereignly ordains your life to go through those circumstances. So you make the, the right choices or the wrong choices. It's kind of a muddy doctrine, but it was actually the Jesuits answer to Calvinism. And I was wondering if that view had anything uh, in line with orthodoxy. Wow, that's fascinating, Mike. I have to admit, um, you know, I learned the hard way a long time ago as a teacher not to make stuff up in front of a class. So I, <laughs> I'm going to have to admit I don't know about that. Uh, I will. I will very happily look into it, though. Um, I, I did want to actually. Uh, you, you would last week you would ask a question about Arminianism, and I, I thought we maybe I could just re remember that. So that um, that's kind of an interesting thing in some ways because. From what I can tell, I'm not, you probably know much more about it than I do, but from what I can tell, it sounds more or less what the Orthodox position is, um, at least in terms of predestinationism. But, you know, so there was this fellow named Johannes, I believe, Arminius, who was this, um, you know, basically was trying to, he was still a Protestant, but he was trying to kind of, uh, he didn't. He wasn't willing to go as far as Calvin went with this kind of absolute rigorism, you know, when it comes to uh, predestination. So he he essentially worked out a position that, in Protestant circles, comes becomes known as Arminianism. Not Armenian. It's not the country, but Arminianism. Uh, and um, it is the idea that God predestines because of 
our free will because of the actions that he sees in our free will. Um, it, so does that, and that, I mean, if, if that is what it is, then that's uh, that is basically what the Orthodox uh, belief is about that. Do you, does that sound right to you, Mike? Yeah, I, uh, I, I would say so. Um, that's actually what I was before I became Orthodox. Okay, um, can you, can you but, yeah, speak to that then? Yeah, sure. Um, it, it is similar in the sense that the Ar Arminians believe that you do have free will. They don't believe in uh, predestination the same way that Calvin did. They believe that human beings have much more of a say in it, but they have this doctrine called provenient grace, okay. where it, when they say that, what they mean is that God will give everybody just enough grace to kind of regenerate them to, to the point where they have enough free will to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they'll choose to either go with Christ or not go with Christ, where I think that diverges from orthodoxy is the Arminians still confirm total depravity. They mm -hmm. still believe you're you're born basically like as a corpse at the bottom of the ocean. The only difference is that the Calvinists will believe that God will either regenerate you all the way um thus canceling out free will and the arminians believe that god will give you just enough free will to where you can decide and i think that's where it kind of diverges from orthodoxy but you know i still say god bless them i mean they were trying you know they, they right. saw the horrors of calvinism and they tried you know yes well that's that's how that's very interesting okay i didn't know about that nuance there let me see see prevenient grace is not incorrect in the, at least i don't i don't know about the, this this particular what 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 you just said is would be incorrect, um, you know, in terms of like what what they believe. But the 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 original kind of idea of prevenient grace that that God's grace is necessary for us to you know to do good and to to will good to will the good and stuff like that. That's not necessarily wrong, but you see, you, you, but you have to always leave enough room for the synergy of of human free will for that, and something from us has to be there. You see that that is really the, the, and, and I know that that would uh, that every basically like every doctrinaire Protestant would say no to that they would you know because the, the basic supposition of Protestantism is that we do not supply anything for our salvation except for the sin that makes us necessary you know like that uh, you know that, that that makes salvation necessary that that would that is basically the one of the underlying ideas that unites all of Protestant soteriology. And Coming back, right. Michael, uh, when you started your your comment about what was the the name that the Jesuit uh, monk or priest who Philip Molina, you know the, the first thing came to my mind when you said it. It's like it reminds me of the artificial intelligence AI. Uh, you know th th that somehow God is some sort of this uh, enormous machine that can calculate every outcome of the decisions you're making. And that's basically a lot of the scientists believe in that what the AI will be able to do. That's what will be, become divine. And that in, in that regard, basically can be predetermining the future you will. So, for example, based on your mood, based on your biological components, based on your emotions, your growth, your everything. When it puts into a calculating machine, actually can come with a variety of, of answers. Uh, uh, not, not answers, but, but other uh, options options or guesses that what forecasts of what might happen that that would remind you know this is my personal humble opinion about the whole thing i think that in the east uh that the question of that question was not uh anal analyzed so much because because they they didn't have very rationalistic approach to the whole thing mm -hmm. because to me the whole you know uh th that's you know i'm not i don't have any Protestant background, so I cannot speak in the like guys. You understand better the Protestant faith because you are coming from there. But to me, it looks like uh, a bunch of uh, you know, attempts to intellectualize the faith to the point you're basically dissecting everything. Uh, for, to me, the first example of predestination that comes is the the miracle that happened with uh, to simplify the whole conversation, of course, so okay, everybody can understand. Is the miracle with Noah? He goes to the Ninevites. And uh, the, the God determined that he's going to destroy them. And he tells Noah, Noah, go there and preach. Noah says, no, I don't want to go. And they basically, he's eaten by this whale for three days. He goes there uh, and he preaches. And God changes his decision to bring destruction upon the, the, the people of uh, Nineveh. And we see that, uh, that that that's the orthodox understanding at least the, the way i can see it is that why would we think you know that why would we determine god with his determination 
that that's kind of we're, we're you know we're, we're entering a prison of of uh, of uh, thoughts that there is never coming out it's like a maze that doesn't have outcome it's the exit is always to put you back into the maze the exit is the maze itself and it, i think it's um to, to me that's the the reason i it's kind of I love the word mystery when it comes to theosophy because it is a mystery. We don't truly know uh, how, what, but we know because God is free and person, we are also free and we are also persons. And to me, yeah, that, that doesn't make sense. If I could make a comment on a Bible passage, I like that example you brought up of Jonah and the, the Ninevites. Um, but another one, and it's a biblical example too. And I think it's very, it can be, I've never brought it up with a Protestant, but I could imagine it being helpful is, when you think about uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 20, when um, Christ had just sent all the apostles out, I think he was coming down from Mount Tabor after uh, being transfigured. And the rest of the apostles come back to him and they're rejoicing and they say, Lord, we're casting out demons in your name. And then Christ says, um, don't rejoice that you cast out demons in my name. Rejoice rather that your names are written in heaven. Yeah. Now, Judas was amongst those apostles. Exactly. Thus, thus implying his name was written in heaven, but then he eventually betrayed Christ. So now the Calvinist doctrine would necessitate he betrayed Christ. Therefore, God willed him to do that. He was predestined to, to do that. And if that's the case, why in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, does Christ essentially say that Judas's name is written in heaven? Well, two things. Uh, first of all, we have a false assumption that Judas was uh, condemned because he betrayed Christ. That's not correct. Mm -hmm. uh, also, Peter betrayed Christ and most of the apostles. Peter actually cursed against Christ. He actually was sitting by the bonfire and he was talking against Christ. And they recognized him that he was with Christ because of his dialect. And he said, no, 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 I don't know this man. And he sits with him. Uh, Judas falls into sin when he, after his repentance, because Judah repents, but he saw that he, what he did was wrong. And he, if he did the same thing as Peter to cry and repent, he would have been forgiven and he would be still one of the 12. Instead, he chooses a different path and goes, he hangs himself. That's the fall of Judas. That's why the suicide in the church is so tremendous, so, so important. The other thing is that Judas also receives the Holy Communion and he receives the Eucharist along with the other apostles, with the 12 disciples. He's sitting with Christ. He's also receiving the Holy Communion. But right after that, he goes, betrays Christ and he commits suicide. Meaning that we see here that uh, when we use the word predestination, uh, it's a very deterministic, fatalistic, that uh, when, when God says something, that it has to be like that. But then, if that's the case, we should all be cans of Coca-Cola. He doesn't have to create us as free beings. We can just grow on trees and, and do nothing. We'll, we'll be just blown by the wind, and there will be no purpose. The reason why we are free is because God loves us. Love without freedom there cannot be love. So, for example, um, let's say, uh, you know the icon of the Holy Trinity. There is a beautiful explanation by one Russian priest about uh, the icon of the Holy Trinity of the hospitability of Abraham. When we see the three angels sitting next to each other, and there is a circular table in between, you all know, of Andrei Rublev. And they're all looking at the center where there is a, a dish with food. And Abraham and Sarah, his wife, they're uh, serving they're serving them with, with, with water and everything. So the person in, in the middle, it's actually Christ who puts his hand towards the dish. And that represents what we call the pre-time uh, or pre-creation uh, council of the Holy Trinity. That God predetermines the creation of, of, the, of the world. He creates the man with free will, knowing that there is an option for the humankind and the angels, of course, being created as free beings to fall apart, to divert from God, to alienate themselves from God. But even then, he still, by penetrating into the history, he changes the course of history with his own sacrifice through love. That is the mystery of, of what we call the, the, uh, the pre-council of the, of the Holy Trinity, uh, meaning that God is a church. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, even before the creation of everything, he creates everything with an intention to be free. And true freedom can be only achieved if the person who is created as free can truly, freely choose 
to uh, love and long for God, for his creator, but still has the option not to do so. And again, the question of, for example, uh, of a Houston Pope, which answers when Christ descends into hell on the second day when he's crucified and he dies, he preaches and he crushes the gates of hell. That's why we celebrate the resurrection. And what else he does, he asks the question, the uh, fathers have asked the question, were all the people from hell, all the souls who were reposed, they all joined Christ, they all moved towards Christ when they saw that the devil was destroyed, that he, he is the promised Messiah, and everybody rejoiced, and Christ pulls, pulls from the icon as we see Adam and Eve first, and everyone else from Hades. So the question is, uh, was, is it true that everybody, the, the answer is yes, there were people who didn't want to go with him. They, they stayed in hell. Uh, and uh, we still have the choice to do so. While we have that uh, theological understanding that we have to choose not to go with Christ, we cannot talk about uh, that kind of determination. I don't know if it makes sense, uh, what, what I just said, because uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, it, it, the descendants into the, into the hates proves us that uh, even in hates, we have the free will not to be with God. And at the same time, uh, the, the economy of salvation is for all of us to be saved. We are all called to, be, to, to salvation. How that's going to happen, we don't know. That's why the issues we have with the origin father, you know, about is uh, uh, basically a heresy of, of, predest of uh, apocatastasis, of the restoration. That's what they were struggling with, trying to intellectualize again, that somehow, because God is love, he will save everyone. That's the final uh, determinant of our salvation. That that's the that's what's going to happen inevitably. Just it, it will take some time to to do that. But, if, but that's not not good, not correct. Because if that happens, that will cause uh, the loss of our freedom. We're not truly free, and that's a problem. Go ahead, Mark. Oh, oh greetings, Father and Deacon Matthew. It's uh always great to hear how far I had strayed when I first began my uh, <laughs> walk in Christianity. Um, Cause I, I was very heavily, heavily convinced of Calvinism. Um, yeah. But a, as time went on, um, I began to see scriptures that, and this is, this is my point. I began to see scriptures that really you had to force into the Calvinistic model to make sense out of them. Mm-hmm. And that 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 is the that is probably one of the things that began my walk away from a hard Calvinism because it was it was a very academic and rigid theology and sometimes it seemed like it was it gave great glory to God but other times it was just so dark um, and uh, the other the other thing too is it's a little schizophrenic and 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 what I mean by that is um, they will say you can't do anything to your salvation and yet. And yet at the same time, they say, but if you start falling away, you got to get, you got to start working. you got to start striving. I said, but then you can, yeah, you come, you come back and then you say, well, but I can't unless he motivates me. Well, you must, but you can't, but you must try, but you can't because. But then the question is why? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that it's really a, a kind of a, 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 a mud, muddy quagmire of what exactly is going on. So, but then the last thing I'll just say, um, is that, you know, in first John nine, where it says, you know, the light has come into the world and lights every man. So every man is, is not, is, is pretty inclusive. So if that light has been shed on all, then you can't say, well, only the elect it's the light has come on all. So, and, and being comfortable with mystery is a beautiful thing. And that's one thing, an academic approach to the scriptures always destroys is any sense of mystery. Oh, just to just to mention, Mark. I'm sorry for interrupting, but about okay. the, the elect, about the elect. Just I, I I just reminded in one of our lessons of the Revelation, we're specifically going to talk about the the fourteen hundred thousand, uh, you know, elect that are mentioned in the Revelation and throughout the Bible, uh -huh. and how that is completely completely misunderstood by a lot of Protestant uh, denominations. That the word elect, it's not what people think it is uh, like uh, that there is an election and God somehow randomly for example I don't know 5,000 in Africa 5,000 in Russia 5,000 in the United States that will be sa uh, saved and that's about it what about the rest of the let's say 8 billion people that, that still live in, on, on the planet mm -hmm. 
that's something that we'll talk on our revelation uh, studies, God willing, when we get to that. I'm sorry for interrupting. Just wanted to let you know about that because that's, that's also used to trouble me as well a long time ago when I was talking to some Jehovah Witnesses, I think. Yeah, well, uh, election is, su is such a strong word because it, it seems very, there's elect and there's not elect. If you're not an elect, then you're damned. So it's if you take it on the surface of an English interpretation, yeah, it's very, it could be very rigid and and uh, lead you down a, a path like that. But um, um, lastly, uh, lastly too, just another scriptural idea is uh, at one point Christ. I bring this up a lot when I used to talk with Mike. At one point, Christ is saying, "Woe to you, Corozin! If if they had seen what you saw, um, they would have repented." So he, he's he, he's rebuking a, a group of people at that point, um, and and I remember as a as a Calvinist used to say, well, why would you say they would have repented? Because if they weren't elect, they weren't elect. Yeah. You see, so so he he says things that means the outcome could have changed, and so yes. well, so you you start getting in all these kind of mental gymnastics to try to reinterpret. Well, the exactly, plane. Mark. Exactly. Yeah. You see, you, you see, even in the in the case of the prophet Noah. You know, we should say that how can, how can God change his mind? That doesn't make sense. If he said he's going to destroy them because of their wickedness and their sins, he made his decision. He's God. But we obviously see that God is not a, uh, an artificial intelligence who cold minded in a sterile way makes decision that once he makes this, that's it. There, there, there is no change. There is no going back to that. Obviously, there, the repentance is the, that, uh, love force that can break all the chains and all the boundaries of, of our, I don't know, limited human understanding of what life is and the mystery of uh, life is in existence. Mm -hmm. That's why we can't approach the, these themes in a very rationalistic way. That's, that's actually intellectual gymnastics, but when yeah. we try to kind of approach those things. And it put people, you know, if, if it gets, if, if it holds in roots uh, to certain people like it did, uh, look at, you know, Christ says in, one, in the gospel, he says, by their fruits, you shall know them. You know what uh, Kelvin did towards the end of his life? He massacred a lot of people because they disagreed with him. He was doing the same thing what the, the, the Roman Inquisition was doing to the Protestants. Uh, and uh, basically uh, what yeah, Mike says, uh, Protestants regard Bible as highest authority. So disproving Calvin with the Bible is helpful. Uh, but it's not uh, just that example that we mentioned when it comes to just Noah. There are other examples. The one that you just mentioned, there are many others as well. We sh you can also say that Judah, as I said at the beginning, uh, receiving the Holy Communion on the Mystical Supper, being with Christ for three and a half years, then uh, eventually, even after he betrayed Christ, he still has a chance to come back. He would have been forgiven, just like Peter was forgiven. But he chose to do so because he was determined that Judah himself made a choice that brought him into eternity of damnation. Not, uh, not. But there is also another question. Was Judah maybe saved when, when Christ descended into hell, when he redeemed Adam and Eve? So we can go on and on and on. We're trying to answer those questions. We don't know. We don't know. That's why we see things blurry now. But we hope and believe that once when we pass into this, into the other life, from the perspective of the kingdom of heaven, we will know the answers to all of those questions. Amen. Yeah. Mike, what was the name again to that Jesuit, uh, uh, if you can remember? <laughs> the Jesuit, uh, what was this? Yeah, it was uh, Philip Molina. Philip Molina, okay. Yeah, he lived what in the 1600s. He lived in the 1600s, yeah. Oh, okay. his, whole, his whole game was to um find a, a middle ground between the um the strict predestinarian doctrine of the reformers and the uh catholic doctrine um granted I, I you know obviously it's anything that attempts to pigeonhole these doctrines or turn it into a formula is going to end up wrong yeah. but um it's still an interesting thing to look at yes yeah, you know it's interesting there I'm, I'm going to look into it, Mike, okay, and get back to you. You always bring me into such interesting directions. Um, and Because I knew, I have read that it was actually a, a big topic during a certain period of time in Byzantine philosophy, this question of like, 
the interplay between God's will for us and and our own, you know, like what we do with our uh, what we do with our will. And I know that you know, in, 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 not even so much in terms of like predestination or something like that, but just in terms of like, you know, obviously there are things that we do in our lives that are not God's will. Right, every time we sin, that's obviously not God's will. And the more we become entrenched in certain sins, the more we kind of go go off track, right, as it were, in in terms of what God wants for us. Like smoking, for instance. you know, if a person like smokes for a very long time there they may die 20 years earlier than god wanted them to die you know you could look at it that way but at the same time though and this is this is something that i've i've kind of had to wrestle with in my own life i'm sure everybody has at some point you know there are certain moments in your life when you make big decisions that really can put your life on a different track, you know, than it would be in another way. You know, there's certain critical moments, you know, you know, who you marry and, you know, what you, what kind of job you do, like, so, you know, certain big decisions, you know, and you can't help but think on certain occasions, you know, if I had done something differently, you know, maybe that was God's will for me at a certain point to do a certain job. Maybe it was God's will for me to, to move to some place, you know, and, and, and if we, but this is the kind of point I want to maybe end with is that, if, if we push that too hard, if we think, oh, I really screwed up, you know, I really screwed up my life because I made this big mistake, in some ways that kind of puts limitations on God, you know, because what, what the amazing thing is, is that God is constantly, for lack of a better term, figuring out a plan B for us, you know, he's constantly trying to, you know, make, do the best with our, with our lives that, that with, the, with the mess that we've presented him with you know um and 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 you know and and the evidence of this is we're on humanity is on plan b right now right what was plan a for humanity was to have adam it was to never fall into sin exactly exactly but yet but nevertheless we fell off of plan plan a and now look at plan b it was and we have christ and we have the church and it's it's you know this amazing you know all, all these wonderful things so I, I guess you know if we have to keep that in mind that god is constantly trying to do the best he can with with the the, the, the broken things that we keep presenting him with you know and in his wisdom he can make a beautiful thing out of out of the mess that we've made Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think your presentation today was very, very good. There's a lot of stuff in there that, that I learned from. And um, I, I also appreciate your nuanced perspective as well, because, I mean, anybody who, who knows, I mean, you know, who's looked at history, like not all Protestants are created equal. You know, they don't all believe the same things. There are some Protestants who are disgusted with Calvinism and there's some Protestants who just worship Calvin. You know, there's there's massive divides within the sect itself. So um, I appreciate that nuance. Oh yeah, no, absolutely, and you know, and uh, you know, I, 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 I totally, you know, especially living now in Pennsylvania, and uh, you know, kind of being exposed more to you know a very kind of Protestant atmosphere and stuff. I know many wonderful people who are Calvinists, you know, and who are who are very, you know, they're very devout people, and they read the Bible all the time, and they pray a lot, and they they really are very moral people and everything like that. So it's this is no way odd homines, you know, it's 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 odd rem, you know, it's to it's to the heresy itself. It's not to the individuals, you know, because um, you know what I mean. Like this is this is not a personal matter at all. Okay. Um... Let's, uh, Father, because it's almost 7.30, we'll need to uh, finish it up. And uh, God willing, we can, uh, uh, you can send me the file so we can post it on YouTube later. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, I think, I want to thank everyone for, for being here today. God willing, we will have next Tuesday, we'll, we'll continue with our, the, the, the study of the revelation. Father, I think next Wednesday, we won't be able to maybe have the Bible studies because I won't be here. So I don't know how we can do the hosting. Unless I send you the, maybe the, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. I'll okay, explain sure. to you. But if we take a break one, one, one week, it's not a big deal. We'll, we'll continue again the following Absolutely. week because I have to pick up my parents from the airport and oh, wow. I have to uh, drive uh, to New Jersey and come back. So I don't know what time I'm going to be at home. If I come on time, we can maybe start a little bit later, maybe instead of six, maybe six thirty or seven. So we can still do it. But anyway, um, we have liturgy tomorrow uh, from 8.30. Uh, it's, we have Paracas on Friday evening, of course, on Saturday and Sunday uh, we have liturgy. I think some guys from Lancaster are coming to sing on, on Sunday. So uh, 
hopefully it will be very nice. Uh, Father, please say the prayer and then we can finish for today. Okay. It is truly me to bless thee, the Theotokos, the ever blessed and most blameless and mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim and beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim, who without corruption gave us birth to God the word, the very Theotokos, thee to be magnified. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, O Lord bless. To the prayers of our holy fathers, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy and save us. Amen. Amen. Okay.